Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention for our guest of honor, Mr. Con Lynch. Hi guys. Up in the morning and off to school. The teacher is teaching the golden rule. American history and radical maths. You're studying hard and hoping to pass. You're working your fingers right down to the bone. And a guy behind you won't leave you alone. So ring, ring goes the bell. The cook and the lunchroom's ready to sell. You're lucky if you can find a seat. You're fortunate you can have to eat. Back in the classroom, open the books. Glee to the teacher won't know what you look. Here we go. Soon as three o'clock's around, do, 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 do. you finally lay your burden down. Close your books, get into your seat. Down in the halls and onto the street. Open the corner and round the bend. Right into the juke, you go right in. Do, 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 do. Drop the kind right into the slot. Just drop the kind right into the slot. You got it, something that's a hot. And with the one you love in romance, all day long you're with to dance. Feeling the music from head to toe. Round and round and round you go. So ring, ring goes the bell. The cook and the lunchroom's ready to sell. You're ready to look at your get a seat. You're fortunate if you can even eat. And back in the cash room and open the book. Teach the teacher on how you look. Everybody, here we go. There you go, Ty. Well done, lads. That's a Chuck Berry song from a long time ago. It's a great pleasure and an honour to welcome Mr. Con Lynch, his wife Marie and their family. <coughs> welcome to you, his friends, and so many former pupils to this evening of appreciation. Appreciation of a lifetime's service, dedication and sacrifice, perseverance and compassion kindness and humor. The master is the sort of a man that comes along very seldom in life. He has had a profound impact on Relan and has left a legacy that will benefit generations to come. Con Lynch was an extraordinary principal teacher and his contribution to Relan goes far beyond the standard role of school principal. Our countryside is dotted with closed schools. Locally, the playgrounds are silent in Carrigulla, Boracoring, Tullig. And when Keystone services are terminated, it has an effect on the community. Today it's guard stations and post offices that face the bullet. But in 1969 and 1970, a campaign united the community here in Rallan. Parents and teachers sought to maintain the national school. Con Lynch took on the role of school principal when that campaign to stay the execution on our school was at a cusp. It was right down to the wire when Con accepted the role of principalship. It was a case of come at the man, come at the hour, come at the man. Con, if I can ask, when Relan received the happy news and was given the assurance that it would be retained as a national school, it was great news hereabouts, but you saw many other schools closing and you saw the effects of those closures on both the 
students, pupils and their parents and on the entire community. Perhaps you might just say a few words about yeah, uh, thank you very much indeed, Gerard, and uh, Mick, and all my friends. I, I thank you. I am very touched and very humbled, and um, almost, um, uh, well, I'm not a very emotional man, like, but almost a little bit, so uh, we will just leave that at that. So, so, it, it's great. It's great. It's great. Yes, uh, dear, but uh, I did see schools closed and uh, the schools in Balavoni and elsewhere. And look, uh, I've always thought there are two types of thinking in the country. There's Dublin thinking and there's thinking that goes on in the rest of the country, in the countryside. The Dublin thinking is the kind of thinking that would come up with a plan that would say we'll close Rylan, Ahabolog, Bananagri, um, Ahina, Bilna Marav, and maybe Courtford, and we'll build a school at Leeds Cross, you know. Somebody looks at the map, and I, I, an inspector actually said to me one time that that had been a plan. He said it out there in the school. <coughs> a, a school I described as the heartbeat of the community, because there is the young heartbeat. There's the young heart of the community beating out every day in the playground with the children at a play. It's the voice of the community. If the school goes, who would want to build a house in a, in, a, in a rural community where there is no school? Who would want to have to draw their children seven or six or five miles at the age of four or five and for the rest of their lives out of their own environment to a different environment to school? So once the school goes, uh, it's, a, it's the death knell really of the community because people won't build there people will move nearer to where schools are and, as I said again, the, the heartbeat uh, will be gone from the community. It's the young life, the vibrant, young, uh, pulsating, heartbeating, young life of the community. The future of the community is in the schoolyard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sitting here tonight, we may well reflect and think about what's so special about our school. After all, other schools have practical support from their community. Other schools have values and principles that develop positive children into young adults who have a respect for individuals. Other schools gain recognition for the achievement of their pupils. Other schools have excellent playgrounds, perhaps far better than we've seen, uh, sports fields, whatnot. But tonight, we recognise that our past pupils have been influenced for life by the Master. He has encouraged, he has praised, he has motivated our students to develop a very confident sense of themselves. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome two past pupils, Dennis O'Connell and Bobby Healy, who have their own stories to tell before presenting the Book of Memories. This is a craft, a piece of craftsmanship made here in Rennan by Mr. Tim Bullman. Bobby and Dennis. This is your life, huh? Sorry, I'd like to say I'd known Connell for over 40 years and we got on great and he was always very highly intelligent and had all the answers, so thanks, Con. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and Bobby, um, it, it's hard to... I just want to explain, by the way, in case there's any confusion among, uh, in anybody's mind here, that it's the school was the 100 years old, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could forgive you for thinking that because I thought Bobby, when he was in Ronga three, third class, okay? And during the centenary celebrations, and by the way, I want to congratulate all who organized the centenary celebrations and organized them so well, but during those celebrations, I had the pleasure or the unique honor of having my photograph taken with Bobby, whom I taught and made a reasonably good job of him. And, um, <laughs> and uh, his daughters, 
um, and their children. So you just think of that in third class, now he is a grandfather himself, and I am still not even near to being a hundred. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Dennis. Uh, Dennis uh, epitomizes the, the quiet respectability and decency of Raylan. Even though he's a Kilcullen man, um, he, we used to tell him that the, it meant Hollywood, which in a sense, perhaps it, it either means that or the grave of Cullen or the church of Cullen, but Hollywood will do for the moment. So, uh, as I said, Dennis and Julia, his sister, uh, lovely children from lovely, respectable people, and I'm delighted to see you and that you're here making that presentation to me uh, tonight indeed. I'll, ju I'll, just put, I'll just put down this book. There's 40 years of Connie Lynch's teaching memories in Ryland for this book. So we'll just put it back up here a second. I'll have to wear glasses, Con. It's a distinguishing feature to have. We have a few of them. I can remember the first day the new master, Con Lynch, started as if it was yesterday. I started in four class, Con. I had. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 Technically, you're right. The master's you always right. You came when I was in third class, but you actually taught me in fourth. Well, I taught you when the first two days. <laughs> No, no, fine. <laughs> Sorry, Bobby. No, no, Grant. I can't give out to him. Um, he taught me in fifth and in sixth. He gave me a lot of confidence and made, fee and made me feel like I could get on well in the outside world in years to come, which I'm eternally grateful. He was a very good teacher and would help you in every way. He did a lot above and beyond the call of duty for me personally. As my grandma had no care, he drove me the year I left Rylan to two interest exams, which I'm grateful for. I was, I, when I was leaving, I left Rylan School in 1973 and met Con from time to time in the years that followed, mostly, unfortunately, at funerals, which he and his good wife, Marie, never missed. As years passed, he and his fellow teachers were involved in the major improvements to Rylan School. And we can now see Rylan School today as an everlasting monument of Con Lynch's time as master from 1970 to 2009, which the people of Ryland and myself personally, my wife and my family are eternally grateful. Our first child, Marie, started school in 1987, Louise followed in 90, Claire in 93 and Robert in 94. The master Con Lynch again and his fellow teachers did a great job in teaching them for, for life to come for each of our children. Finally, I'd like to say, except for a very few grey hairs, the man I see today, that stands in front of me, has the same drive and the same love of teaching as I met 44 years ago. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I'll hand it back to Dermot. Well said, Bob. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Con, before you sit down, I'd like to ask you to take a, a close look at this beautiful piece of craftsmanship. It was made here by Mr. Tim Bullman, and unfortunately, you suffered a really serious injury to your leg yesterday, and I'm delighted that you were well enough to come and be present here tonight to see the result of your craftsmanship. But you had a magic box and over and over and over again, the children of Relan, including my own, speak about your magic box. Have a look at this oh, yes. <laughs> box. I am sure there's so many of you here in this room that remember the mystery of this fantastic box that had such a special person inside it.
just um, I want to thank uh, everybody, uh, Bobby and Dennis, for making the presentation, and uh, to thank Tim. That's uh, a beautiful, beautiful piece of artistry and craftsmanship in relation to the magic box. I searched the house today and I eventually found it, but I had taken out the mirror. So I <laughs> <coughs> and so I'm really, really, really pleased to have that because even at my age, it's good to look in and say, there's a VIP. <laughs> Con at this stage, I want you to please delve into your own memories of when you were a little boy and the school bell was ringing. Were you impressed by your teachers? Did they have a major influence on you? Because to decide to become a teacher is a big step. It's a, a major commitment in life. Yeah. Um I suppose different people look on their teachers differently. I think that every teacher I ever had was very fond of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I thought that at the time. You know, that didn't mean that I didn't get a few wallops every so often when they were coming to me, and maybe times when I didn't. But, um, yeah, I started off uh, walking to school about three miles across the mountain to Slee Rig School. And when I was about seven then, my dad realized that there was no future in walking across the hill three miles because it'd be wet in winter and summer. And so we moved on to the village in, in Balavoni. So education was um, a, a priority uh, for the family and indeed for the community in, in Balavoni as well. We knew that was either that or immigration. You either went to school, worked hard, or else you immigrated. I suppose the one who influenced my teaching most was a man named Master Hegarty. Um, he had always got great results, but he never seemed to do very much himself. And uh, I asked um, a few lads from Balavoni inside at the sports one time, how was this? He, did, he didn't work very hard, and still he had really great results. And they said, it's because he had the material to work with. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's the answer they gave. So I, I, I say, uh, in so far as you're concerned, yeah, that, that, that is correct, yeah. So, yeah, I suppose, you see, being a teacher is, um, is uh, it's caring. It's a, it's a caring profession. It's, you have to be kind in your nature uh, to, to do it. Uh, I suppose um, it, I could maybe let you in on a secret that I, uh, some of you do know and some of you don't know. But uh, when I was in school, um, the teaching that we learned was that if anybody wasn't baptized, they couldn't go to heaven, you know. And uh, I, I, I thought that wasn't great. Like, so I thought I would do as much as I could to make sure as many people as possible would be baptized. And so after my leaving cert, I actually... Uh, spent a year in the Divine Word Missionary Seminary in, in Roscommon with the intention of being a, a missionary a priest where I would be able to baptize as many as possible and give them a good chance of going to heaven and not for, to have them languishing elsewhere. Now, after about a year there, Vatican II was in progress and we got the documents a bit before everybody else. And one day a document came and somebody read it out, there was a whole crowd of us there, and somebody read it out and it said, now this has changed. A person doesn't have to be baptized with water anymore to go to heaven. If they live a good life, uh, they can go to heaven whether they're baptized or not. So that was my reason for being there gone. And I didn't stay there any longer <coughs> after that. <coughs> but, um, but uh, however, I do firmly believe that that was part of a life that was intended for me. I know it influenced my thinking. I know I think a little bit differently to maybe a lot of people. I know that if there's something wrong and I see it's wrong, I can't in my own mind pass by and say it's not my business. So whether it has to do with a famine somewhere or an issue of right or wrong, 
or uh, you know starving people in the world, mistreatment, um, torture, slavery, of which there's a lot in the world. I cannot in my own mind ever, and I hope I never will, be happy to say that doesn't concern me because it always does so. That motivated me to, um, in different campaigns that I was involved in. But from that, dear Madame, and I'm sorry for having such a long answer to your question, but uh, from that year that I spent there, I just had a different perspective in life perhaps, and um, teaching children is a caring, it's a altruistic, it's a place where you can hopefully do good. Now that doesn't mean that I didn't make mistakes, and a lot of them as well. But uh, for better or for worse, I did the best I could. And um, I love the teaching. I love to come and see the lads there in the morning. We had great fun. Most days, some days we hadn't, but some days you have to lay down the law too. So, all right, dear man. Again, sorry the answer's so long, but um, it's maybe time that. Um, that I gave that answer, okay? It's fair to say that Africa's loss was Reliance gain. <laughs> I suppose it's the old saying once again, God uses good people to do great things, and certainly here in Reliance. Now, Con, I've arrived eventually at St. Patrick's Training College in Dumcondra. It's the largest primary teaching college in Ireland. And we have a fellow student of yours here tonight. And, sorry, Con, it's not the Taoiseach and the Kinney. <laughs> <laughs> but a lifelong friend of yours, Mr. Pat O'Leary. Pat, you might tell us about those days of, and nights of swatting and studying. Was Con Lynch ever seen without a book in his hand? Um, I can honestly say I never saw him with a book in his hand, but, uh, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> uh, could I just uh, say, the nights, like the the yes, yes. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get to that. It, it's a bit, it's a bit like being at Khan's funeral, except that, um, the, the, the corpse is very, <laughs> is very well. I'm hearing all these things about him, but, um. I knew, I knew Con before um, a lot of you did. I knew him before he had a pioneer pin. Um, <laughs> back in '68, when I when I went to Pat's, Con had already spent a year there, and he was the student representative in St. Pat's. There were 300 of us together, all fellas, 60 of us in a house. So in each house, and there were 30. First years and thirty second years are hedgers and gents, as we were known. So, but uh, Con was the first man that I met there, and uh, he put me right as to where I was to go and what was expected, especially when it came to uh, weekends and down in the club Gaelic. Um There was a dance hall down in Parnell Square. I don't know if it's still there, kind of. <laughs> But you see, students from St. Pat's, we, we, we used to get in for nothing. Because nominally, if you had a couple of focal, you, you, you could get in. And uh, Con was always a good dancer. So if you followed Con, like, you wouldn't go far wrong. Even if the female clientele might have been a bit more mature than us, maybe, <laughs> in general. But when I came to teach then, and Ahabolo Con had, was already well established in, in Ryland, I started in Ahabolo in 78. I served my time in, in Bishopstone. But um, over all the years, I can honestly say that Con and I, we were good friends. We had good fun. And Con always had some campaign uh, going on at the time, whether it was Move the Mountain, which somebody might be speaking about later, or INTO campaigns for conditions or... Uh, the conditions of teaching principals getting a bit of administration time. And even in retirement, a lot of you would know that Con is hidden tail of making the diocese uh, a safer place from the point of view of child protection. And uh, I'd like to thank the organising committee for the opportunity to be here and to uh, say well done to Con and uh, 
So best of luck and many more years of retirement and thanks for the friendship. Thanks, Con. I'm told that the places to go now are in Drumcondra include Quinns and the Big Tree. Now, as everybody here knows, Con is a very suave and well coordinated dresser. He's never seen disheveled, and I'd like to call on Rebecca Kelleher to present Con with a set of cufflinks and a type in of a, a moment of those nights out in the town. <laughs> But um, thanks for teaching me for three years, and I've learned a lot out of it. And I hope you do well in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Rebecca. Yeah. Rebecca was one of the last lot of students that, that I taught, and uh, having taught her uh, lovely mother, uh, Helen, before her, um, it was a pleasure to teach both of them. They were both courteous, respectful, respectable people. And uh, I know that you'll do well. You've changed a little bit, mind you, since I saw you. <laughs> so, uh, th thank you very much indeed. Um, I actually could do with a type in. <laughs> so thanks very much thank indeed. Today. Thank you, Rebecca. Con, I've known you for many, many years, and one of the things that impressed me from the first days I met you was your strong sense of social justice. You've been involved in so many campaigns, seeking change for the better, improvement of services for both schools and students. You were the coordinator of a West Cork Parents Association committee that wrote a report called Vices at the Grassroots. We have a copy of it here, and it's still as in an important document today as on the day it was first published. Perhaps you might just say a few words about that. Uh, oh, okay, dear man. Now, to start with, I just want to link anything that I did is linked in with the school and it's linked in with the teachers there who taught with me and with the parents and with the children as well. So I just want to, just to absolutely establish that as the basis of everything I say is linked in with the school. So, uh, at one point, I, being a parent myself, I attended a meeting of the Parents' Association, and it happened to be the AGM, and I was asked if I would be the chairperson, and I was happy to do that. And then I was asked if I would go to the, as the delegate to the county, I was happy to do that. Now, Voices of the Grassroots refers to what the people down in rural Ireland think as distinct from what the people in Dublin think, okay? And the people in Dublin's idea was that there should only be four teacher schools maximum and that every other school should be closed, okay? So we did research and um, we established, we just asked questions um, from parents and from teachers and also from, from children. Now, I discovered early on in my life um, having been involved in student politics, as, as, as Pat O'Leary said, and having, by the way, been asked to leave the office of the Minister of Education at the time, along with some of my colleagues, we were there to meet him. Um, I'm digressing now, but he was actually Brian Linehan Sr. He was the father of the former Minister for Finance, Brian Linehan. He was Minister at that time. And we were looking for some various things for Pat and other students in the college and those who came after us. And the college president asked us, um, he said, look, um, if he promises you something, would you ask him to put it in writing? <laughs> so um, we were young anyway. I didn't actually ask him, but the president of the Students' Council, uh, he asked him, and we were asked to leave the office immediately. <laughs> Uh, which we did, but in about two minutes we were asked back in again and handshakes all round and we actually did get what we were looking for and it benefited people who came um, after us. But uh, as I said, uh, the smaller schools had been neglected. They weren't getting enough funding. They were paid by the number of uh, students who attended and um, 
the administrative workload of the principal was increasing enormously. One day I got a telephone call from my brother, my late brother Dennis now in, in Ovens, and um, he said, I got a cheque for seven and a half thousand pounds from the department for a secretary, and I don't want a secretary because I'm not teaching at all anyway, because I have eight teachers. And I said, there's no justice in the world, you know, <laughs> because we only get 4,000 to run Riley School, and I'm teaching full time, and I have to answer the telephone as well. So an idea formulated in my mind uh, round about that time that if he were free for full time with eight teachers, that I should be free three eighths of the time with three teachers. And uh, that I, uh, idea then developed from that, that uh, teaching principals should have time release to do some of their uh, administrative duties. Now, it's no use going to a minister or anybody unless you have an argument that you can back up. And that's why we did this research and we presented it to various people, and, um, including Michal Martin, who subsequently became Minister for Education and he then set up another committee following that. So, Raylan children feature very much in this because uh, they were at the launch of it in the City Hall where the Lord Mayor launched it and they feature in the pictures and so too do um, Eileen O'Sullivan and David Savage um, who were both working at the time. Before I forget it, I want to mention the enormous help that Johnny Cooig has given to the school um, over over the years as well, and also that uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, also another uh, Denise, uh, who is down here, who was a great secretary and a great support for for, for many years, and um, Maureen Bly as well, who with her uh, you know perpetual good humour and cheerfulness uh, lifted our spirits for the time she was with us uh, in the FOSS scheme as well. So, dear Med, that's basically it. The small schools are being neglected. We launched a campaign to make sure the principal had time release, to make sure they got secretarial grants, to make sure they got maintenance grants to maintain the buildings, and to make sure that they were adequately funded. Okay. I think it's very fair comment to say that after that report that the Department of Education kept a very close eye on the master. They requested Khan to participate in a working group on the role of teaching principals and I believe this is the document that came out of that. So a very substantial tome as well. Now Khan's sense of social justice was never quite, I don't think your mind ever rested and a campaign that was of the utmost importance to people in other faraway places became very important to you and to many, many people here around Relan and West Cork. It was called Move the Mountain. And before the band plays, a very well-known song of the day. Perhaps you might just tell us a little bit more about that Move the Mountain campaign. Okay, uh, thanks, dear. But now there are many, uh, or at least some students down here, um, and I see them who were in school that time. You see, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, it's no use me saying I'm a Christian, because uh, saying I'm a Christian doesn't make you a Christian, to my mind. I'm only a Christian if I behave like a Christian. Uh, no, that doesn't mean, as I said, that I didn't make my mistakes, and I did. But in terms of if people are starving and they spare food somewhere else, a Christian can't remain silent in those circumstances, I believe. Uh, equally so uh, in the present time, where Christians are being persecuted and murdered in different parts of the world, I don't think we should be as quiet as we are about it either. But just back to that, uh, television news every night showed pictures of starving people in Ethiopia around 1984-85. Now, to us, it was terrible. They were skeletal caricatures of humanity. They didn't even look human. And to this day, um, 
I and the, the children who were there at the time, again, as I said, many of them were here. There were mountains of food in the European community at the time, including shiploads of it down in Cock Harbour and so on. And we couldn't live with this because we were the rich men, in a sense, and they were only just across the Mediterranean Sea and they were starving. And there was one particular uh, scene. Uh, Tom McSweeney was out there, I think, and um, a young boy, about 12 or maybe 13 years, arrived in the food camp and he had, uh, I think, one, one or two children with him, but he had a young sister which he had carried on his shoulders. Now, they had left home and left their father who was dying and they, they had to let him to die. The reason was a drought, that's what caused it. But they had to let him to die, the mother, the, the 13 year old and the younger children. But along the way, the mother died. And the boy brought the young girl on his shoulders uh, to the, the, the feeding station. And um, even reading back over the song and the rest of it in the last week or so, I, I'm still touched by that, you know, because anybody would have to be touched by that. And so we launched a campaign to try to have the powers that be in Ireland and in Europe to share the food with the people who were starving. So that's simple. And uh, a lot of people helped. Uh, Mrs. Buckley, who I see down there, um, was very helpful in that. And uh, along with Mrs. Healy, um, we went into Dawn Square in Cork and we collected signatures for the day. We got huge support. There was a whole lot more to be done, uh, said about it as well. Paddy O'Connell from the NGOs here and Pat O'Leary, uh, we launched it here in this hall, by the way, and I think Dan Joe filmed it. But, like, just that's it, like, as I said, if we are Christians, it's no use saying I'm a Christian unless uh, I do uh, act in situations where things are clearly and blatantly wrong. We eventually met the teacher, Gareth Fitzgerald, and, um, the best he could do was to promise that in future situations would be monitored so that a famine would not occur almost unknown to people ever again. Now, I don't know if, if they did monitor or not, but I don't think things happened with that great severity ever since. Um, we composed a song uh, because it was very difficult. You know, we were teaching catechism in school and we, we had to leave it in regard to that. So. Um, a reporter from the Corkman came to the school, a girl named Beady Joy, and she printed it on the paper. The, the children sang it for her, and I think, I think the lads are, are going to sing it now, but the song is only peripheral. The main thing is the issue, that there was food rotting, costing money to store it, and people starving not so far away, and we couldn't live with that without saying, uh, you have to do something about this. So that was it, dear and the best way we can do this, Con, I have to say, we don't have the recorder that had the piano on it, like you start the music with us in school. Do you all remember the recorder with the... We don't have a Con, but um, we will try and start it right here anyway. My daddy... My daddy and I went out to sow, but the rains didn't come and the crops didn't grow. My daddy and mammy thought it best to go They couldn't bear to hear us crying And I heard across, across the Mediterranean Sea There's a mountain of food, but none for me And milk and wine that could fill the sea We're here, my daddy lay dying So my mother and my brothers and my sister and I we couldn't around for my daddy to die The trek was long and the earth was dry We just had to keep on trying And I hear that across the Mediterranean Sea There's a mountain of food, but none for me And milk and wine that could fill the sea While here my mammy lay dying so now 
that my mammy and my daddy were dead We struggled to the camp where we might be fed I, My sister kept crammed slightly round my head I cried but I wasn't able And I heard that across the Mediterranean Sea There's a mountain of food but none for me And milk and wine that could fill the sea it must be rich man's table Yes, I heard that across the Mediterranean Sea There's a very rich man named the EEC With mountains of food and wine filled sea All on this rich man's table Lynch, despite setbacks, never relented working towards his long-term vision for the school across the road. He always encouraged community involvement with the school, and eventually that partnership achieved a facility that will always be his legacy to Rolan. Willie Dinehy was the keystone in the partnership between the community and the school at a very critical time, and it's a pleasure now to ask Willie to speak about his memories of working with Khan to modernize the school. Will it any age? Perfect. Um, I suppose my knowledge of uh, Khan Lynch is mainly through being involved in the Board of Management, and um, it would it be in the last, what, um, seven years of your teaching in Rennes. And I suppose you achieved the most for the building of the school itself in those last seven years. And I was lucky enough to be involved, um, uh, to be involved and see you at work. It was pretty amazing because to begin with, I suppose, how the whole thing manifested was, in, it was initially, I think, to the day we went up into the attic to check the leaks in the roof. And um, we realised that the leaks were a bit even worse than we expected and that it was going to be a, a pretty big job that had to be done to the roof. So what, made, what followed on from that was Con, the all-knowing Con Lynch found out that there was a, a new small school scheme. Ironically, for men, that was constantly trying to improve small schools. There was a new small school scheme that was on the go with two or three years, I think. And uh, through uh, a lot of work and dedication, eventually he got the, the big grant to develop, improve the school, the main building of the school. And the reason I say the main building of the school is there's different phases to the whole thing. So that was the initial um, big job. That was Everybody that was involved at the time knows about it. Um, the, grant, the grant was got. Um, I think it went up to, was it Athlone, was it? Or no? Tullamore, sorry, yeah. And um, I wasn't privy to too many of those conversations because most of them were in Irish. But um, I just um, stood backwards and, and, and stood back in the, uh, against the wall. But anyway, um, that, that was got. Uh, we realised, I think, uh, through the process of um, costing the whole thing, that there was going to be, would you believe it, maybe more than we needed for the initial development of the main building. And... I think around that stage we came up with the phrase phase two, <laughs> which wasn't there initially, um, but to complete phase two, which was going to be the, as everybody knows, the hall, um, and the hall is really the doing of Con Lynch. It just would not be there without that man. No way. He persevered in getting following up funding um, to bolster what we already had, and the phase two was built being the hall that we have today in, in, in the school. It was a, a building that um, was meant, it could be, it could be used for numerous, numerous um, uh, purposes, but it, it was, it's there to accommodate everything that, that is being used for now at the moment. It has been used by uh, numerous groups uh, during the last couple of years, um, I suppose. And he wasn't finished yet. Then, as obviously that, um, made playground quite small and he had tried numerous times um, before trying to uh, get a bit of ground for the school um, and eventually 
um, as I say, a third time lucky, I think. Um, the, the ground for up the back school was got. Um, this all was completed by, I, I suppose, summer of 2009. And then, lo and behold, having everything done, what does he do? All he tells us, he's retiring. Just catches us all out of the blue, but I suppose, and even even the piece of ground that you could see up there at the side of the school was another um, a bit of genius, you know. I just uh, I we have we, the school has what it has, the Royal End the community has what it has um, because of Con Lynch and his dedication and in, in, in what he did over the last over his f mostly 40 years in in, in the parish. Um, as was well as you all know, he's he's multi talented. Um, there's definitely a politician lost in him, but then again, there isn't because there's plenty of time yet. <laughs> Con, thank you very much. Thank you, Willie. Thank you for those uh, those nice words. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce a few people and first I want to bring up here is Martin and Daniel O'Rourke who will make a presentation of a voucher on behalf of the past pupils and parents. Martin and Daniel O'Rourke please. I'd very much like to ask Greg Long, please, to make a presentation of flowers to Mrs. Maria Lynch. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much, Amelia. Paul and Kate Pangan uh, to present, uh, to introduce the cake that she baked herself, I presume. This, this cake is designed in the shape of a car which was uh, very well known here in Roland because it transported uh, the master and many of the pupils to the school for many a year and I'd, I'd hate to catch the, catch the boys uh, on the hop up here for another Chuck Berry song rolling along in my automobile. <laughs> I'd say there's no hope of that one. But well done on a great piece of craftsmanship by Kate Mangan. We'll, we'll enjoy chewing on this later. So now I think uh, at this stage we'll take a break and maybe sample some of that cake or, uh, or sample some cakes anyway. So I think we're going to take a break for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and uh, have a cup of tea. And after that, then we'll resume the festivities again after that.